Hi everybody, I'm Chris Pulligar, one of the physicians here in Syracuse, New York, and I'm also a paramedic, and here I have my partner here. Dave Landsberg, also a physician, also a paramedic. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about oxygenation and ventilation. And the goal of this is to give an overall idea about what the concepts are and how we're going to be using them in the automatic transport ventilator resource in, in the protocol. Our hope is that a little bit deeper of an understanding about what all those knobs actually mean and what the underlying principles are behind the usage of them will actually empower our paramedics to make good decisions in the field when things don't go just as planned. So Dave, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the difference between the assist control and the SIMV modes that we would typically be using in the field. Sure, Chris. So assist control is there so that we can define clearly what type of ventilation the patient is going to get. We, the user, program the ventilator so that the patient gets the same breath every single time the ventilator is triggered, whether the patient triggers it or whether the ventilator triggers it itself. The things that we set in assist control that are important to remember are a rate and a tidal volume, a peep, and an FiO2. By setting these parameters, we can guarantee a given minute ventilation. The concept of minute ventilation is extremely important. The minute ventilation determines how we will eliminate carbon dioxide. The minute ventilation is very simply the amount of gas that you move in a minute. So if we simply take a tidal volume and multiply it by a rate, that gives you a minute ventilation. So with sort of garden variety ventilator settings, if we set assist control at a rate of 10 with a 500 cc tidal volume, we would have a minute ventilation guaranteed of five liters. The next thing to understand is that if we set this at a rate of 10, that means 10 into 60 every six seconds. So every six seconds, this machine will give our patient 500 cc's of tidal volume. What defines assist control is that if the patient in that six second period decides they want an extra breath and the ventilator is smart enough to figure that out, the ventilator will give them the full 500 cc's. So it's important to understand conceptually that the minute ventilation for a patient in assist control will always be a multiple of the set tidal volume. We have a guaranteed, in this case five liters, and if the patient wants more, they can take more, 500 cc's at a time. So Dave, with assist control, you get a guaranteed minute ventilation. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference with SIMV? Sure. With SIMV, you will still get a guaranteed minute ventilation, but SIMV is used to try and get a patient to tend to breathe a bit more. This would be something you might see more traditionally on an interfacility transfer on a patient that may have been hospitalized already for some time. I think if we go over the parameters that we set, we can a little bit more easily identify how they're different. So synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. With synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, you still set a rate, but on the inpatient side, we tend to set a rate that would be somewhat lower than what we would have set had we had the, had the patient in assist control. So let's just say we set the rate at five. Traditionally, SIMV is a mode that we've used to start to wean the patient. So you've usually been on a ventilator for some time when we use SIMV, except in the PACU setting where we use it routinely every day. You still are gonna set a tidal volume and we'll keep it the same just to keep the math simple. So here, we have a patient who is gonna get five breaths a minute instead of 10. So every 12 seconds, the ventilator is gonna give that same 500 cc's. Obviously, the minute ventilation that's guaranteed here is half what it was here, with the idea that the patient will now take some spontaneous breaths. The way that gets handled is we add one more parameter when we deal with SIMV, and that's pressure support so that when the patient takes that sixth, seventh, eighth, however many numbered breath, anything above the set five, we then give the patient a little bit of support. Randomly, we set those numbers five, 10 centimeters of water. 10 centimeters would be pretty typical. So you put on 10 centimeters of water of pressure so that when the ventilator senses that the patient is inspiring, the ventilator puts an extra 10 centimeters of pressure into that circuit 
to make the breath easier on the patient. That differs from assist control because in assist control, you're only going to get that 500 every single time. And here, you're going to get whatever 10 generates in your patient. It's a very important distinction between ventilation that targets volume versus ventilation that targets pressure. When we target volume, we guarantee volume. When we target pressure, volume now becomes a dependent variable and that volume may vary. If in fact you have a patient who has pretty healthy lungs and is intubated for another reason, say epiglottitis, and you give them tenor pressure, they're going to get a lot more than 500 cc's in your average adult. But if you have a patient with significant lung injury and you give them tenor pressure, you're going to get demonstrably less than 500 cc's. So it's very, very important to understand that when we're targeting pressure to ventilate our patients, we don't guarantee a minute ventilation. And this hybrid mode then has the ability to guarantee our two and a half liters, usually enough to keep you alive, but then let the patient draw above them. So with assist control, if the patient um, triggers a breath, they're going to get the full 500 cc's each and every time, as opposed to the SIMV mode, in which case if they trigger a breath, they're going to get the pressure support of 10 centimeters of water, but not necessarily the 500 cc's of volume. Is That's that correct? correct, Chris. Okay. So if I'm out in the field and I have a patient who I want to put on the ventilator, and uh, I'm just starting with um, putting the patient on the ventilator at that time. Do you have a suggestion as to which mode I should choose? I, I do. From a safety's sake, and especially in an acute setting, initially putting a patient on a ventilator, you really should go with a guaranteed minute ventilation where you know what every breath is going to look like and you can guarantee that you're going to get a fixed minute ventilation at the end of the day. The, the pre-hospital environment, as well as the inpatient environment, are sometimes fraught with so many acute urgencies of another nature that distract your attention, that if you're not paying close attention in this setting, this patient may be just getting five good breaths a minute, and every extra breath that they're trying to take, and there may be 20 of them, may be wholly ineffective, generating no tidal volume, and doing nothing but getting your patient to get exhausted, ultimately desaturate and become dyssynchronous with these every 12 second breaths because the ventilator will try to give a breath every 12 seconds unless you're actively breathing at the moment when it tries to give this breath and in a patient who is struggling their respiratory rate might be so high that when this machine goes to give a breath every single time it may not give it simply because you're already breathing and in that case, we don't even get our two and a half liters of minute ventilation. Yes, your machine will alarm over and over and over again to let you know that what you set in didn't happen. However, you're going to find yourself in an alarm state with a lot of things going on when had you guaranteed with assist control, I think your life might have been a lot simpler. So Dave, um, as a critical care physician, if you were to be sending a patient to another facility, when might you suggest that the patient um, be put on SIMV? Sure, Chris. It, the most common times we're going to be doing interfacilities will either be one, because we're upgrading the care in the acute setting and we need to go to a, a higher end facility, that patient will probably be on assist control. However, for the other type of patient who is more at the other end of their stay, when we're sending somebody to a ventilator facility for more of a long-term wean, it's very likely that they're going to be on SIMV and that they have been for some time. I think that in the transport environment, it is probably safest to have the patient on assist control if at all possible. That said, if the facility conveys that the patient's been stable on SIMV for quite some time, if the facility conveys that the patient has some element of dyssynchrony with the ventilator when on assist control and they tend to ventilate better on SIMV, I think that's okay, but it's going to demand of that paramedic a much more acute understanding of what we've talked about, and you've got to watch that minute ventilation, and you've got to watch your end tidal CO2. If your end tidal CO2s start creeping up, that's telling you that the obligate minute ventilation plus what the patient is doing on their own is insufficient. 
And that's when you should be thinking, maybe I should flip this patient over to assist control, or even more simply, simply turn up the rate on SIMV, because you can get there. And if you meet their need, functionally, if you're on SIMV and you don't take any breaths, you're kind of on assist control. That makes perfect sense, Dave. So Dave, we've been talking a lot about uh, the settings of the ventilator itself, but I think that a lot of the concepts that you're bringing up also apply to patients who are not on the ventilator. Um, as providers, we do ventilation all the time, even if it's with a simple bag valve mask, and the concept of minute ventilation sort of goes along with that too. Could you explore that a little bit and how it might apply to the patient who might not be on an automatic ventilator? Sure, Chris, I'd be happy to. It's positive pressure ventilation fundamentally, whether we're talking about a ventilator, whether we're talking about a bag valve mask with a tube or non-invasively. We, as the provider, will be managing that patient's minute ventilation. It's important to remember the formula. The formula for minute ventilation equals rate times tidal volume whether it's the patient's spontaneous rate and tidal volume or whether it is the provider's rate and tidal volume, that's what generates that minute ventilation. Minute ventilation, the clinical parameter that we look at is carbon dioxide elimination. When we speak of ventilation, that particular part of respiratory management really refers to the elimination of carbon dioxide. We eliminate carbon dioxide, as you know, with each breath. A deeper breath and more of them eliminates more carbon dioxide. This is why for some disease processes we may hyperventilate. For those who have been really keeping up on our literature over the last five or ten years, you'll know that we hyperventilate people too much, especially in the arrest setting, and that we've got to pull back on that. We have a lot of power to control our patient's physiology through manipulation of their minute ventilation. If you see a patient's end tidal climbing, it means they need more minute ventilation. So you have two things that you can control. You can get more out of each squeeze on the bag, and that may just mean making a tighter fist with each one. It may mean using two hands to get more gas out of the bag. And it may also mean just doing it faster. Either way, you'll get a higher minute ventilation, and you should be able in real time to see that end tidal CO2 fall. So Dave, to affect the end tidal CO2, if you're having some issues with that or you need to adjust it one way or the other, uh, the only two parameters that would essentially do that are the rate and the tidal volume because what you're affecting is the minimum ventilation and that's reflected in the end tidal CO2, is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So Dave, as a separate concept, we have the concept of oxygenation. Can you tell us how that differs from minimum ventilation? Sure. Minimum ventilation, as we talked about, is the amount of gas going in and out in a minute, summed up by tidal volume times rate. Oxygenation is more of a clinical parameter that can be affected by a patient's minute ventilation to some extent, but the things that we are going to more readily manipulate on the outside are going to be how much oxygen the patient is on, as well as the mean airway pressure. The mean airway pressure is just that, it's the pressure in the airways. We do not have a dial on our machines or a dial on our BVMs that allows us to dial in a mean airway pressure. However, we do have PEEP. Just a little quick physiology. If we say a normal breath looks something like this, where we have PEEP at the bottom and peak inspiratory pressure at the top when we squeeze that bag and put the air in, the mean airway pressure is going to be somewhere in between. The more we raise our PEEP, the more we will raise that mean airway pressure. So the way that we raise mean airway pressure is by adjustment of PEEP. So by increasing FiO2 or by increasing PEEP, we can increase oxygenation. We are simply pushing the gas across the capillary alveolar membrane. Whatever's in the way, be it water, be it pus, be it an aspirated uh, stomach contents, be it blood, by pushing harder, which is the net effect of raising the PEEP, we can force diffuse that gas more readily. And that is the advantage of turning up the PEEP in that scenario. The one that you're very much aware of that you have all cared for many times in the past 
is the application of positive pressure to a patient with pulmonary edema. They so rapidly improve because in pulmonary edema, we have a situation where we have an alveolus that has water in it. When we put enough pressure of air inside that alveolus, we push the water right back out to where it belongs. That's the simplest application of the use of positive pressure to infuse, to improve the infusion of gas from alveolus back into the capillary. So just to recap, what you said here is that with oxygenation, that's reflected in the SpO2. So if we have issues with the SpO2, we can affect that by either changing the PEEP or the FiO2, is that right? That's absolutely correct. But do keep in mind that as you increase the PEEP, your peak inspiratory pressure may go up as well. And in the pre-hospital setting, we would really like to see that number stay under 40, ideally under 35. What's the issue when the, when the peak inspiratory pressure goes too high? What's the concern there? If the pressures get too high, we can actually burst an alveolus. We can actually cause pneumothorax. Pneumothorax in and of itself is not the worst thing that can happen. But while we're on positive pressure, that pneumothorax by definition will become a tension pneumothorax, either slowly or quickly, depending on how many alveolar units we rupture. So the maintenance of making sure that those pressures don't get too high or that those volumes don't get too high is vitally important to make sure that our patients don't generate what we term barotrauma or volume trauma. And the concern with anybody who is being positively pressure ventilated um, is that the probability for barotrauma for that pneumothorax or even the tension pneumothorax goes up. So we really have to be cognizant of our patient and keep an eye on the patient and make sure that they aren't developing any signs of the tension pneumothorax. We absolutely do. The simple exam repeated over and over and over again. If you have nice vesicular breath sounds on both sides, you probably don't have a pneumothorax that you need to worry about. There could be one, but it's not tension yet if you've still got equal sounds on both sides, but you do have to watch for it. So Dave, just getting back to the automatic transport ventilator for a minute, um, you had mentioned earlier, if there was one thing that, one piece of advice that you can give um, when you run into trouble with the ventilator itself, what would it be? it would be to take the ventilator out of the loop. There's a lot you have to troubleshoot on that ventilator. Uh, if you're using one, you've been educated on it, we trust. Uh, you understand that there's all sorts of tubing, there's all sorts of knobs, there's all sorts of dials, there's all sorts of places. It plugs into your action rail, it plugs into the patient. There's so many different tubes, there's so many different connectors. You can't solve it fast enough. So simply come off the machine. If you can't solve it in a few seconds, with an obvious disconnect and you plug it back in, that's the easy one. But pretty much everything else with the alarms just keep going off and you don't know what to do, get off the ventilator. Get off the ventilator immediately and bag the patient. Do pay some attention to what PEEP you were on. And if you were on high PEEP, make sure you tweak your PEEP valve on your ventilator, on your BVM, because that will be extremely important. You will lose some of your oxygenation and make sure that you turn your high flow oxygen up to flush when you plug it into the back of that bag so that you'll be able to keep your saturation and keep your oxygenation while you do it. But it's extremely important that if you feel lost and your alarms are going off and your patient is decompensating on a ventilator, the most important thing to immediately do is get to a bag. That will give you all kinds of clinical feedback as well. If you have a tension pneumothorax in there, you're gonna know when you go to squeeze that bag. The ventilator is just going to give you alarms. Get off the ventilator immediately. You may be making things worse by leaving them on. So I think the general concept is when you're having problems, go back to the basics. And I think that's probably one of the most important concepts in pre-hospital care in general. And in this particular case, even if you have them on the automatic transport ventilator, you want to make sure that you have your bag valve mask close at hand and that you also have your mask close at hand too, in case that tube gets dislodged, you'll be able to ventilate them effectively while you're fixing the problem. Absolutely, Chris. As always in everything that we do, preparation and anticipation are gonna be the best things you can do for yourself and your patient. 
All right, Dave. Well, I really appreciate your time, and thank you guys for your time as well. I wish you guys all the best of luck, and I'll see you out there.